Contract, a Commander podcast. I'm Mike Almond, and joining me is my co-host, Alex Lapp. Alex, what's up, man? Not too much, Mike. Today we're doing an episode about a website that you probably already know about. Yeah, especially if you literally have made a deck outside of uh, the cards that just happen to be in your closet or listen to any one of the podcasts we've done so far now that I think about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking about EDH Rec. It is a ridiculously uh, detailed and just... It's the compendium of compendiums as far as I'm concerned, as far as mm -hmm. uh, brewing resources, information. Uh, and we want to go into it as far as some of the things that we like to use it for on a fairly common basis. I mean... I don't, I'm not necessarily building a new deck every day, but, I mean, compare it to the people that say, oh, I, I read Playboy, but just for the articles. I actually do use EDH Rec because of the articles uh, quite a bit. I know that there's a couple of things that you wanted to talk about uh, that they've come up with that are pretty unique to the game, and that's our topic today. We want to go and dive into EDH Rec, and with a little bit of a surprise uh, towards the end here. So, Alex, Ooh. why don't you go ahead and start us off? Sure, Mike. I'd like to start by going through one of EDH Rec's most prominent features, and that is a index of the top commanders and spells that are from all of the different decks that they've gathered throughout various deck building websites on the internet. So they really are the uh, not just a, a place to find your commander some cards, but also to see what's what's the meta of the world, what's what's the zeitgeist right now. And uh, I think we should start by, by going over what some of the top commanders are, and we can talk a bit about uh, maybe where some of the old top commanders went, or if you're surprised to see any of them. But the top one right now is uh, is Golos, Tireless Pilgrim. Yeah. He's actually surpassed Atraxa. Um, as long as I've been playing the game, um, until Golos came out, really, Atraxa was uh, the number one. For, right. Basically, from the day she released until the day Golos was released. So, like, four years. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually a pretty recent change, too. Because, I mean, uh -huh. the, Atraxa... Even just scrolling down to it, it, the last two years, it was it was only until recently. You're right. And Atraxa was pretty comfortably on top, with Moldrotha being close. And Golos has overtaken it considerably. But yeah, it's one of those things where, to get a good feel for what commanders are essentially the most built, but also being able to check, you know, just in the last month, and being able to check in the last week, and... To be able to see some of how the game is changing by the way that people are brewing decks, and by brewing decks, what commanders they're actually using to do so, it's it's pretty interesting to have that kind of compendium and to look back on it. Um, just scrolling around with it, real, real, real excited that uh, I managed to find Arden, my 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 White Ranger, <laughs> is uh, is on the board there for uh, fifty decks of the last week. So hey, we got it going. Nice. So one thing I noticed, and, and mm -hmm. you brought this up, we see Golos, we see Atraxa and Moltrotha, Korvold, Kenrith, and, and Yarok. These kinds of commanders all have something in common, right? They all have a very open-ended build pattern. There's yeah. no uh, distinct characteristic Moltrotha deck. I mean, maybe it's Sultai good stuff, but you, you understand right. where I'm coming from. Um, you can build all of these any way you like, and mostly they just have sort of a light framing element, like Atraxa has proliferate, so it's literally any kind of counter deck. I right. mean, Super Friends, Infect, plus one, plus one, ability counter, like anything. Uh, and Golos is the same with, with lands and big mana. It's, it's these commanders that really you can just do anything you like, and they're very popular. But we also have some that aren't like that. Mm -hmm. We also have Yuriko the Tiger Shadow. That's a yes. very specific strategy. It does why one do you, thing, why and do you it think does that it Yuriko good. Yuriko is is on the list like that. Uh because it it does one specific strategy, but it is the absolute best at doing that strategy. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about top deck manipulation and cheating out something to do a lot of damage to everybody, I, there's not a whole lot of things that feel as like as effective as powerful as Yuriko as far as just on a power level statement but then the fact that a that b it's ninjas dude that's freaking awesome yeah, like it's uh, ninjas. 
ninjas. Uh, nice. And the fact that the ninjutsu mechanic is just kind of a cool thing. Like, everybody likes doing the, ah, you fell for my trap card memes. This is literally a trap card because you're just like, ha <laughs> I'm swapping it. Now it's there. Ah, right. you didn't expect this from my So I can see that being, you know, part of the reason just because it's ridiculous. I think that's also when you get into the things where you, the ones that have a lot of ambiguity as it can do a whole bunch of different things or it does one thing really, really well, that's where you get into the things like, you know, Markov being the best vampires commander and mm -hmm. people like playing tribal. Uh, Alela, uh, who likes doing artifacts and enchantments and getting bonuses for doing artifacts and enchantments. Well, people just like playing artifacts and enchantments as is, right. yeah. et cetera, It's, it's et cetera. not too complicated when you're when you're looking at it like that. Like, you want to play a lands deck, you probably pick Lord Windgrace. Um, sure. Unless you have a reason not to, and you want to play a reanimator deck, you're going to pick Marin. So these are either very strong or uh, very open-ended. Yep. And most of them are both. So... Mike, I don't know if you can reach back in time sure. and think back to when you started playing Commander, whenever that was, and uh, what what were the quintessential, like, big, like, oh, no, Commanders back when you were playing? So I had the benefit of when I started playing Commander, I had played Magic uh, growing up, and I took a really long break, and I had just been playing, you know, the standard type of Magic. Mm -hmm. um, it turned into my friends convincing me to play Commander with them, which I had never heard of until literally sitting down and playing with them and going, oh, yeah, this is way better. <laughs> um, and, and the decks that I started with were my friends uh, Niv Mizzet, the Firemind deck, and uh, his, his also his Talrand Permission deck. So oh. those are the ones that I started with. And... At the time, I felt like Niv Mizzet was one of those decks that was pretty rampant because Storm, lots of draw, ping, combo was, I mean, it, it still is an effective strategy. Those That's the one that I remember, um, but I, I also have pretty tempered thinking because I, I'm biased. That's, that's what was right. literally so you're saying to you, me. You played in a... Uh in a like a kitchen table meta for a long time yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. and in that meta the was was the king uh pretty much uh, it was literally the deck that was given to me uh as as a going away present because they wanted me to keep playing even though i was going to be in a different state but i was i wasn't the only one who got that deck <laughs> i wasn't the only one who had that deck even on the way out but that that was the main one what about you so one big one that I remember that I don't even see on this list, yeah, she's not here, is Kalia of the Vast. Kalia of the Vast, mm. when I was beginning to play, was the queen of, like, just beat the table down in submission. Now, newer players may not be as familiar with her, so I'll, I'll read her. I know we haven't been reading the other ones, but they're really popular, so I assume you guys know what they say. But Kalia the Best is one red, white, black for a legendary creature, human cleric. She's a 2-2 two -two with flying. And she says, whenever Kalia attacks an opponent, you may put an angel, demon, or dragon creature card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attack that opponent. So that was... That was very strong for the time, and it still sounds pretty it's strong. It's still very strong. <laughs> right, but... I mean, I think that's really just a testament to how power crept the uh, the game has become, right? But she is quite strong still, but you don't see her at all. I haven't seen her at all. She's not on this page. I haven't seen anyone playing her. I think that's um, I think that's because of two different things, though. I think a because it it there is some power creep, like you're saying. Yeah. I think the other thing is we talk about commanders that are remove on site. Yeah, she's and, removed on side, yeah. And I think there's I think there's a lot of time that's gone by with people saying, Oh, I remember that card. I've lost to that card with some swift foot boots or some lightning greaves more than once. No, this thing doesn't get to stick around. But you don't think that most of these commanders aren't kill on site, like Golos is kill on site, Atraxa, Moltrotha, Yuriko. They are, but like I, they're kill on site. 
their kill on sight with with one little bit of difference to me. Atraxa, sure, been around for a long time. Um, but when you get into Kenrith, Corvold, Golos, these are even well, Muldroth is a decent bit a uh, bit ago, but. Kalia, when did that card come? When did Kalia come out? Uh, she came out in Commander 2011, the first set. So there's been a long-standing tradition of this being, uh, nope, absolutely not card. Where the rest right. of these, I, I think if even if they're at the same power level or even a higher power level and a higher threat, they haven't been around a long at, or at excuse me, they haven't been around as long. So the amount of feel bads and threat assessment and, uh, you know, again. Oh, I'm in danger. Uh, it's it's not as high, so I think that over time, I think a lot of these, uh, even the ones that have been here for a while, I think they start to diminish a little bit over time. But I don't know. Maybe I could be completely wrong off that. No, I think you do have a good point. I wanted to to bring up something adjacent to that, which is sure the same thing that we've seen in popular media. If you go back in time, you can see that. Uh, it was a small number of very iconic things in media that we remember. Like, think about how many very popular things you can think of for the 20s. You can probably name, like, two. Maybe. But then go to the 50s, you can name a handful. Go to the, mm. the 90s, there's, like, an unlimited number of things you could probably name. Sure. Um, and the same sort of wearing thin and spreading out of of this thing that I'm talking about also applies to, to Commander. So back in... Hmm. When uh, Kalia was around, she was one of the most powerful commanders ever made. Um, she was made explicitly for commander, right. which is a big difference. But I wouldn't necessarily say that Kalia is really that much stronger or that much weaker than most of the people up here. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. some of them are much, much more uh, good for combos. But what I'm really saying is that Kalia is more of a focus point, like Kalia and Nekusar and um, various other commanders of that age, because there's relatively few of them that were really standing out. And now people run lots of different decks right? with lots of different scary creatures. So they're all still scary, but our fear is, like, diffused. Sure. And, and Does that make sense? No, it absolutely does. And at the same time, I'm, I'm making this... this uh, counterpoint of, oh, well, you know, some of these commanders, they've been around longer, and it, you know, at the same time, there's reprints and things like that that come into play, but then I look at it, and they go, oh, well, Atraxa is the second most built commander in the last week, in the last month, okay, maybe maybe some of these commanders are here because some they are just here. Some things never change. <laughs> well, oh, some, something that does change pretty often, at least towards the middle, but uh, towards the top, it's it's still been pretty standard. Are the actual, they have the commanders and the most built commanders. They also have just the top 100 cards across all colors, across all builds. I love seeing that, especially when you go to the past two months or the past month and uh, past week even. Espe when you're going to new card sets and things along those lines. Um, but then unfortunately I look at the... The, well, the most cards index, and I get very uncomfortable because, well, there, there's Cyclonic Rift just staring at me and Counterspell. And, but then we talk about Signets and, and Ramp Spells, and I feel a lot better about it. <laughs> um, I remember in the past, Cyclonic Rift was the second most popular spell in the format. And currently, it's the sixth. Yep. Which is a big change. Uh, it's still the most powerful and popular board wipe in the game. It's mm -hmm. the second most powerful blue spell in the game after Counterspell. But Swords to Plowshares, Mike, would you have guessed that Swords to Plowshares was the second most played spell in the entire game? So here's the thing for me. I am actually surprised that Swords to Plowshare was below Cyclonic at a point. And oh, I, much below, yeah. I Right, and I think for me that's because if... If you are in a deck that has white, you have to have Swords to Plowshares. If you are in a deck that has blue, power-wise, you have to have Cyclonic Rift. But because it is such a ridiculously powerful card, I I have a couple of Cyclonic Rifts 
I don't play any of them because it's 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 expropriate kind of power to me, and I don't play that either. Um, one of the things that does make me very very happy as we look at this, and I'm gonna do a quick scan. One, two, three, four. Okay, so of the top, eh, <laughs> of the top eighteen cards, there are four that aren't ramp spells. Love that. Love love me some ramp. Good job. And it just it's a good way of kind of studying what is important to the game, even to just kind of cataloging it the same way that you would when you're building a deck. Okay, I need to have more of this. I need to have more of this. And it does feel pretty representative of just essentially the game at large. It's a, this is it's a really cool thing to be able to look at. Now this is relevant to to mention there the people at ADH Rec have ranked these not by uh, gross number of decks, right? But by the proportionality that these cards have in the colors that they could be represented in. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, we have cards that are in more decks. Cyclonic Rift is in ninety five thousand decks, but because that's only thirty nine percent of blue decks, is it Signet is technically more popular because it's in 40% of is it decks. Um, that's just, that's the metric they're using. It's not wrong. Numbers. Right. Even um, though it's in half in, in half as many decks as Cyclonic Rift right, is, it's right. in a higher percentage. It's more synergistic as far as they're concerned. Right. Yep. So it's not really just that it sorts to plowshares, um, but that's, that's multiple things, right? It's a removal spell. Mm -hmm. Spot removal spell. It's a white spell. And it's arguably one of the most powerful white spells ever made. This is this is White's peak, right? That sorts the plowshares, path to exile. Yep. The one mana, just complete bombs, land tax, the value that White can produce at a single mana, terminus. And that's that's kind of epitomized by this card that's very cheap mana wise, it's very cheap for money. Sure. Um, it's been reprinted like fifty times. And for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but then it's the if kind you, of card that makes you splash white. Right. And but at the same time like it's it's such a powerful card, right? And yeah. these signets are very effective tools. I mean, if you scroll down just a little bit, you mm -hmm. get to Lana War Elves, which is just this, you know, it's this one mana mana dork which is almost in like okay, I'm playing green. If I'm playing elves, I'm definitely putting this in there. If I'm playing Big mana, I'm probably putting this in there. I like that it's not just these absolute powerhouses mm -hmm. that are in cards or that are in decks more consistently. And it it runs the gamut of expensive cards, cards that are less than a dollar. And it, it gives you a good look at what the actual format is and what it cares about. Looking down this list, Mike, is there a card that jumps out at you and like, how on earth is that card this popular or... Or the reverse, how is this card not more popular? Uh, the first one that jumped out to me, I mean, I I can't believe that Arcane Signet is several tiers below Soul Ring. I understand Soul Ring has been around a lot longer. Right. But Soul Ring is in 77% of decks. Arcane Signet is in 27%. Right. So I think the important thing to note here is that Arcane Signet had a very high price for a very long time. That's true. Before it got the big reprints at Uncommon in Commander Legends. Um, this this was a $20 plus dollar card. Mm -hmm. And I think the market has memory of that price such that if you weren't specifically eyeing the price to go down and then buying it when it got lower, yeah. you would just have in your head, oh, that's one of those expensive mana rocks that I can't afford. And I think that's really reflected here because you're right. Arcane Signet is one of the strongest mana rocks in the entire format. Um, it's so versatile. It's so cheap. But once upon a time, it cost five times as much. And right. People are like, oh, that's, that's not in my price range. You know what I'm saying? That does make sense. Uh, that's my theory. Yeah. I, it's also a lot newer. Like, I get it. It is much it's newer. It's just... I mean, unless you're playing Mono Brown, I just... <laughs> Soul Ring has been included in, in every Commander deck that's ever been printed. Sure. Right. And so uh, up until recently, up until this recent Commander's Legends set, uh, Arcane Signet was only put in 
recent commander decks and brawl decks. Right. But now that I, I feel like there's enough of it around now, and it, and the word is out, Alex. <laughs> I feel like no, Arcane Signet that... is going to climb uh, as it goes. But that was that's, the one that that's reflected right in yeah. this in this ranking. Soul Ring has been here since time immemorial. Soul Ring is one of the oldest cards right. in the entire game. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, now now I'm going to finally do the smart thing, and I'm going to start to scroll up and see if there is a big disparity. Between, yeah, so in the past month, Arcane Signet has jumped up considerably. It's 81% for Soul Ring and 53% sure, for Arcane Signet in the past week. Here's something interesting for me. Um, Merciless Eviction is in yeah. 23% of all Orzhov decks, Orzhov Plus, uh, which is 26,000 decks. It's right behind Birds of Paradise and right ahead of Swan Song. When's the last time you saw a Merciless Eviction? I haven't seen that card get played in ages. I mean, it's very... I'll, I'll read it here. Merciless Eviction is a four white black sorcery. Uh, choose one, exile all artifacts or creatures or enchantments or planeswalkers. It's great, but that feels like something that started to fall off a bit. Yeah. And I, I'm surprised to see it so popular. I think we're getting... Especially with the game getting faster and faster and, and with people trying to get more efficient with their mana as they can with new cards. Uh -huh. I think we're coming into more of a targeted removal because it is usually cheaper uh -huh. and because it takes out things as a threat ahead of much faster. I think board wipes are starting to diminish a little bit. I, I could be totally wrong on that. I think that's a that, big but... claim. I, from what you were saying, like when's the last time that I've seen Merciless Eviction? I don't know. I see targeted removal every game. Board wipes as a group, I don't feel are diminishing. I just feel that certain board wipes are being pushed to the back. Right. Like and Merciless that's, Eviction. And that's what I'm saying. I, 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 let, me, let me rephrase. I think with the game getting faster, I think with the game trying to get more efficient for a lot of people building decks, that... There are so many targeted removal spells, and of all of the board wipes, if you can become more efficient with it, whether it's mana, whether it's what it's getting rid of, or the reason that Cyclonic Rift is as popular as it is, is because A, it can be single target removal if it is, but the real issue is that it is asymmetrical and that it is an instant speed. So when you get into how efficient and how variable and how important, it, it has to have a it has to be a banger in some way for it to always be included. And I think that's why Merciless Eviction, even though it's on here, again, 23% is a lot. I don't know. I'm with you. I don't know the last time I've seen it. Here's the next thing that, that really bothers me about Merciless Eviction is that so Cyclonic Rip is sixth place. Uh -huh. Merciless Eviction is the next board wipe after that and it's like 40th place yeah so yeah. what happened there are we saying the merciless eviction is the second best board wiping commander i don't think that's true i don't think it's true but i think exiling versus sending it to the graveyard is if if it's something where you care about that it's important um because then it's only a little bit later that you run straight into blasphemous act and supreme verdict, at the you know following it. I, I don't it's know. It's almost like, <laughs> it's almost like board wipes in general are just they're vegetables that you have to run unless it's psych rift, in which case it's like tempura. So you're yep. happy to you're happy to do it. Yep. Um, but even blasphemous act, like blasphemous act, when played. The way that you would want to play it costs one mana. Right. Which is a pretty aggressive cost for wiping the entire board. Uh, but it's sitting here below Merciless Eviction and only barely above Supreme Verdict. See, and here I am. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking maybe it's because it's reprints. Maybe it's because, you know, Merciless Eviction got a reprint not a terrible long time ago. But yeah, then, but so did Blasphemous Act. But so did Blasphemous Act, and uh -huh. then I look up, and in in the last two in the last month, Supreme Verdict is only is only a little bit behind it as far right. as overall builds. I don't know. So I, they're all accessible. Yeah, I see. These are these are the reasons why it's good to go onto 
these lists and figure out what the trends are and what's How going confounding. on. If you have insight on on why you feel mer- merciless eviction is so highly represented, let us know. Talk to us on Twitter. Um, Man. We want to hear about your ideas. I do too. And about any other weird things that you saw, like why is this card up here? Tell us. Let's let's go ahead and move on to a, to another top list, Mike. Yes, please. That, uh, this is this is a very different list. This is the saltiest list. This is the best list that exists in <laughs> this, Magic because it's correct. Is, it's all this the correct. List. This is the list that everybody voted on which cards they hate the most. The cards that make them the saltiest. And they do this once a year. This this most recent one is from July of 2020. Uh, so let's let's just look at some of these, Mike, and... Uh, and let me know if anything jumps out to you. So at the top we have Stasis and Winter's Orb. No surprises there, really. Like that's that makes perfect sense. Yep. We talked about those specifically as cards. I did as as cards. I would not uh, really mind seeing banned in the format. Uh, uh, and Static Orb isn't too far. What what really jumps out to me is we did a really good job talking about the cards that we could ban if we had an opportunity. Because I'm looking at the top sixteen, and a good portion of them are things that we've already discussed. Yeah, it's interesting. So after after Winter Orb and Stasis is expropriate, which you've mm-hmm. spoken on several times, it is it is quite a fantastic card. I don't know if I would say it makes me salty, but obviously it's it's a very win the game spell for nine minutes I, for sure. I have a theory. It's I think because the table votes wrong. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I so was going to say card, I don't yeah. think it makes you feel salty because right. you are very good at encouraging people. Yes, I know it sinks to have your stuff taken from you. Right. But let's go ahead and read expropriate and explain the <laughs> gamut that we're talking about. So expropriate is a uh, seven blue blue for a sorcery. Consul's dilemma. Starting with you, each player votes for time or money. For each time vote, take an extra turn. For each money vote, choose a permanent owned by the voter and gain control of it. Exile expropriate. So basically, what's going on is you either lose your best thing or give the player an extra turn. The answer is you lose your best thing because you, for every extra turn they take, that's another very strong chance they'll win the game. I don't care what you have. Yep. Unless you have something that will instantly make them win the game if they gain control of it, give it to them. There are things that that could happen. Like I, I know there piece. are, but... Yeah, but most of the time... Man. You, <laughs> most of the time, you need to give them your best thing. Listen, they might not even choose your best thing. They might choose something that you uh that you don't care about as much because it, it helps their board more it's the best thing um, for them yeah yeah honestly it's the best thing for them never vote for time what is wrong with you they're um, already going to get one extra turn why yeah, give them voting. two yeah. why give they're them three gonna, they're not going to gain control of something that they control like what uh and then right <laughs> after right after expropriate is is vorinplex the voice of hunger um which is incidentally three ahead of, of jenga taxius the the predator that uh, you wanted to to see Blech. that, so Shit. both of those praetors are are kind of ahead of all of the other praetors. Yep. In cards that people really didn't like, and that makes a lot of sense because because I see exactly why people don't like those cards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Static orb, and then we see our first board wipe, which is actually above cyclonic rift on the salt table, a uh, jokalops, which is a four red red sorcery that says destroy all artifacts, creatures, and lands that can't be regenerated. Right. It destroys lands, but Mike, th- there's there's other land destruction spells on this list. Uh-huh. And this is above all of them. This is even above Decree of Annihilation, which uh, I pointed that one out, which is uh, remove all artifacts, creatures, lands, graveyards, and hands, and exile them. Um, so that, in my opinion, is... Like even saltier. That's I guess that's why I voted for it. It's worse, um, but I think I think the difference between six mana and ten mana, right? It, I think that's part of it. And then you get into Armageddon next, which, yeah, it's a lot cheaper, but it just destroys lands, which just makes mm-hmm. it makes me very sad. But usually, if somebody is just destroying lands, they're doing that because it's going to put them in a position to win. Uh, it's, right. Uh, so I mean, I. I get it. I uh, Jockalops. <laughs> it's also fun to say. We haven't really talked very much about mass land destruction, and that's really sort of the essential um, example that people bring up when mm-hmm. they talk about the social contract. It's, oh, you know, the social contract, like mass land destruction. That's yep. the thing that you don't do. But 
don't I don't think... tap my lands don't take away my ability to play the game well, don't... there's many things and and we absolutely right. should have an episode about social contract at the namesake of our podcast but uh we see some of that represented here right we see uh the stacks pieces the really oppressive stacks pieces mm -hmm. like uh stasis and vorinclex and jenga taxius we see uh the really strong board wipes like Psycrypt, Jokalops, Decree, Armageddon, Obliterate. There's like a ton of board wipes on here. And then other things that punish you, like uh, the Tabernacle of Pendril Veil, vale, which is that non-basic land from Legends that taxes all of your creatures. Yeah. Um, I think I think what's interesting to me on this list is the first... So there's Expropriate. Yeah. And then after that, the next card that just takes away other players ability to play the game mm -hmm. uh, or sorry there's expropriate which i mean gain extra turns grab stuff from people i think again that it's probably a couple of slots higher because like like we said people vote wrong and then that right. makes other people at the table very sad right all of these cards outside of that are ways of stopping somebody Stopping either somebody else or the entire table from being able to play the game of magic until you get to Urza. Yeah, look <laughs> at Urza down there. And even then, it's not until Narset a little bit later where it's these are cards that are something that make people salty because holy cow, they now we're going to get into the endless loop and the value and, okay, right. here we go. I wonder if I'm going to play again kind of stuff. So that's that's something else I noticed, right, is that the vast majority of these cards micro spells. Yeah. Um, if we go for commanders, Vorinclex and Jin are in the top uh, few here, but then all the way down to Urza. Then after Urza, we go all the way to Send Triplets uh. and Narset. And then from there, it's down to Grand Arbiter Augustine, and after him is a Cory Dust Drinker, which is the, the legendary creature from Kamigawa that makes lands not untap. But between those, we have another 50 spells. Yeah. Why do you think uh, why do you think that is? I think because spells are something that are a lot harder to stop. It, <laughs> you can remove a Vorniclex. You can remove a Jenga Taxis and uh, possibly prepare for it to come back. If if somebody cycles a decree of annihilation, well, congrats. <laughs> uh, tabernacle, well, that's a land. So if you have land destruction and targeted land destruction, great. Um, everything else is something that takes resources away or removes resources from your control. Just, I think that's part of it. Some of these things that have a toughness, you have the ability to do something about it. Where all these traditional, you know, instant sorceries... And again, even land, it's a lot harder to do something about it without having the exact right card at the exact right time. I mean, maybe depending with a broad brush, that's broadly correct, but there's plenty of permanents on this list that aren't commanders. Yeah. I'm seeing a Smokestack, Mind Slaver, got Blightsteel Colossus. Right. Um, but when you get into, I mean, Blightsteel, I, I'm actually kind of surprised Blightsteel isn't a little bit higher up just because of the indestructible. But right. when you talk about things like stasis, winter orb, static orb, yeah. smokestack, you're talking about enchantments or artifacts, which are, there's plenty of things that destroy it. But you also have to have the ability to do it right then. And mm -hmm. if you can't do that and somebody plays stasis, I don't care if you have some kind of disenchant in your hand because you're not getting an untap phase. <laughs> I don't care. It's, it's a being able to do something about it immediately. That's that's kind of where I'm at on it, and for the most part, I, right. I do agree with the list. I, I is there anything that jumps out at you as like that shouldn't be on there? I mean, the ones that I'd like to say make me salty are like, it, it, I don't I don't want thieves auction to be on there because I think chaos is fun. I you know, but like <laughs> I get it. Um, thieves auction right next to warp world. How about that? Yeah, I will say this. I'm kind of surprised that humility is on there. Yeah, um, I mean, it is a stacks piece. It does take away uh, abilities. But there's, I mean, what's the what's the one that turns it into a, a an indestructible bug? 
uh, dark steel uh, mutation. A mutation. Thank you. Dark steel mutation. That's way worse to me. <laughs> but that That's... only locks down one thing, and it does it quite well. I know. Um, humility, in addition to locking down your board, taking away abilities, then you have to deal with layers. Yeah, that's and fair. And people don't like layers. Now, I like layers, but that's because I like spreadsheets. If you don't like spreadsheets, <laughs> you might not like layers. And layers is an interaction of magic rules. Specifically, layers is the interaction of continuous effects, which are effects that go on for a duration of time. Okay. And they have many, many different rules that relate how they relate to each other. We're not going to get into it at all. If you want to have a whole judge episode about it, we could briefly go over it, but it's way too complicated. But losing all your abilities doesn't necessarily mean those abilities don't uh, stop happening. Okay. But <laughs> anyway, back on topic. The one that I... I'm not really surprised to see it. I'm sad to see it. The Mind Slaver is on there. I like Mind Slaver. I understand that it's not fun to be Mind Slaved. But yeah. I think that with, with the... <laughs> With a little bit of change of perspective, once you, once you give up any any hope that you'll win, it can be fun because you're like, hey, <laughs> what? <laughs> now my life is a joke. Oh and I'm man! I'm being puppeteered by a cruel asshole of a master. So it's fun as soon as you give up any kind of yes. potential for being yes. happy about it. Okay, it's, cool. it's fun when you give up hope and just revel in the. Just strangeness of it. Yeah, the super... strangeness of someone looking over your shoulder and say, "Hey, throw that in the graveyard." You're like, "Why?" <laughs> super shocked that Emrakul is only a couple rows below that. It's so weird. It's so weird, Alex. Mind Slaver is um, much easier to recur than uh, than Emrakul. Oh, for sure. I mean, even though Mind Slaver is not a commander. You have the quintessential Mind Slaver lock, which is Mind Slaver and Academy of Ruins. So um, so what have we learned? People don't like it when they don't get to untap their stuff. They don't mm-hmm. like it when they don't get to draw cards or have cards in their hands. They don't like it when everything gets destroyed. They don't like being locked out of the game because of an endless combo. They don't like, right. their, na- they don't like their turn being taken over. Right. And a little bit lower than that, they don't like it when you set all the cards to the side and then randomly start taking stuff back. Feel them out like it's blackjack. Yep. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's what people don't like. Mike, uh, is there anything that you don't like that isn't represented on this list? I'm pretty happy with this list. I'm okay, not that's lie. good. That's I'm. Good. I am a little upset that people get. Uh, Guy's Cradle is on here. Why do people like Guy's Cradle? Well, Guy's Cradle is one of those cards that's really, really good, but it's also really, really expensive. It's one of those cards that if every green deck could afford to run it they probably would and that's kind of a salty feeling right if you can't afford something to not run it i have a recommendation uh just proxy, proxy it, it. Yeah, proxy <laughs> is that really it's, the issue it's it's, it's like a 500 dollar card sure um and it's so good mike but, i love guys cradle but what here's a, here's what my a, argument alex like okay it is absolutely expensive let's say that yes. you're somebody that just nope i I, I, I will not ever proxy a card, so I don't like sure. it when I see Gaia's Cradle because it's so powerful and so expensive. Sure, um, that's fair. Gilded Drake is like five cards away from it, lower. And mm-hmm. Gilded Drake is actually <laughs> oppressive and makes me salty. <laughs> and that's an expensive card too. So I I don't like it. I don't like the rankings. Boo. Gaia's Cradle's fine. Everybody hmm. be nice. Blah. Be nice. Okay. <laughs> How about you? Is there anything? Is there anything else on the salt list that you want to talk about in particular? Uh, you know, I don't believe there is. I think that's uh, we've got it pretty much covered. Okay. Golos is on the list towards the end there, which towards again, the end. which again now now is the most popular built commander on EDA yeah. Trek. So part of part of being popular is also increasing your infamy. It would seem. <laughs> Right. But it's not really a direct correlation. Like, Urza is quite popular, but he's not, like, the third most popular commander in the game. That's right. But he is the third saltiest commander in the game. <laughs> uh, um, anyway. Uh, Urza. So let's let's talk about one last thing that, yeah. that surrounds EDH Wreck. And you might have heard this one if you've listened to their podcast or read some of their articles. Um, and that's the EDH Wreck effect. 
which really is not at all unique to EDH rec. It happens uh, everywhere, but it's basically the idea that homogenization occurs as uh, people use common ground to to build things that then contribute to that common ground. So people make a deck, they're referencing EDH rec when they make it. Uh, they publish the deck, the deck becomes indexed by EDH rec, which reinforces the the cards that they chose off of EDH rec. Um, that's just the nature of popularity, really. Sure. But it's also not a thing that isn't happening. Right. It's definitely happening. And I think the that ties into kind of a larger conversation, which is the increase in power level mm-hmm. in the game of Commander. Yeah. And I don't I don't think it's quite the same thing because EDH rec isn't really let's say EDH rec is is mixing all of the the decks together and homogenizing them whereas um the input of of content creators and the internet at large is sort of to to hone the deck with a whetstone and to make it sharper. Okay. So since EDH rec isn't really doing that I feel that that effect is happening slower on EDH rec itself, right? You mm-hmm. you have the the homogeneity, but you don't necessarily have the speed. But it is there, right? Like we're, right. we we're talking be. about old commanders that aren't on the list anymore. I mean, how do you feel about this? So I get what you're saying, and kind of what I like is when you go into okay, I want to build a deck and I'm going to use EDH rec as a resource to see what other cards synergize with that deck. There isn't just a field that says, I want the best version of this deck. Give me a hundred cards. It's okay. Well, are you that uh, I just clicked on one randomly and ended up with Omnath locus of creation. Uh Okay. So view as a commander. Great. So I can see stuff that synergizes with it, but are you playing it as a land stack, a landfall deck, a pod deck, an elemental deck, a plink deck, a bounce deck? Uh, are you doing cheap? Are you doing expensive? Here are different links to go to different places. You can jump to different things. I like that it gives you, this is the synergy with the commander. But it's not a be-all, end-all resource as far as this is what you have to put into this deck. And I think that is a user error thing, not an EDH rec thing. Well, if, we should be clear what what synergy actually is. Sure, synergy is a measure of how uniquely represented that card is in that commander and mm-hmm. that color uh, group, but not in other commanders of the same color group. Okay. So if let's say expropriate is uniquely popular in Jingataxius, but like no other blue deck runs it, they all do. Uh, <laughs> then it would have very high synergy in Jingataxius. Got it. But if it's in many decks, then it's not going to have that high of a synergy. So that's what it really is. It's people are running that card in that deck, but not in other decks. Okay. That makes sense. That make that makes sense. I it's I like having the resource of of sometimes it's man, I need to build this deck. What card should I get with it that I don't know about? It's a great resource for that. Mm-hmm. It's a great resource for pushing you in the right direction. For me, if I'm using EDH rec specifically on building a deck, I'm usually using it to make cuts at the end because I'll get my big pile of cards and then I'll start cutting down. And when I get to 20 left, sometimes I'll see, A, which one of these aren't or which one of these are on EDH rec and which ones are the ones that are synergizing and being played with this commander the most. Right. And then depending on how weird I'm going to make the deck, sometimes I'll cut the ones that are on EDH rec because I want to make it as weird and different as possible. Mm -hmm. And if I'm trying to make something powerful or I'm trying to make something where I'm not sure, well, then I'll let the website kind of guide me in that direction. It really kind of depends on what I'm trying to do with the deck that I'm building. Does that make sense? That does make sense. I've never considered EDH rec as a resource for cards to avoid although i guess that really is just the other half of the coin yeah is if you want to make your deck more synergistic and run better and incidentally more like other decks 
then an idiot wreck can tell you which cards to put in. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to make your deck less synergistic or more unique, then it has a list of cards that you can try to take out. Or um, even, I've never thought about it like that. Or even if... I mean, you've run into this before, I'm sure. Even if you just want to power down a deck a little bit. Right. It's... It's one of those ways where okay, I'm gonna make some cuts. What should I? What cuts should I make? And the first thing I do is I take a cyclonic rift and I say, well, this doesn't belong here because it belongs in every deck. Um, but stuff like that. Um, it's right. it's it's a good way of looking at all of it on the same page and see a lot of cards without doing the a beautiful mind uh, sketches on the windows and cards laying all over the floor for you to figure out what is the 98th and 99th card that you're going to put in a deck. I think this uh, transitions very well into our advice section. So if you want to uh, take a break, yeah, we'll come back and talk about basically what we just said, but phrased a little differently. Exactly. Uh, let's do that. So I'll tell you what, everybody. Uh, we'll be right back in just a second here. We'll come back with some advice for everybody, a couple of cards that we very specifically want to talk about today because we've got some spicy ones. Uh, and then we're going to close with a little bit of surprise for everybody. So we'll be right back. Hey, it's present Mike filling in for past Mike. Our audio has gotten so much better. Thanks for sticking around with us. So we're going to talk about some cards that are really underplayed. We each think that we're bringing some really interesting cards to the table. And if you want to grab them or any other cards, you can help us out in the process. We have partnered with TCGplayer.com. So if you're looking for any singles, sealed product, deck boxes, sleeves, playmats, really anything to spice up your game experience, go to bit.ly slash EDH social or click on the link in our show notes. You don't pay anything extra, and you'll really help us out by buying all the things you are going to anyway. That's bit.ly slash EDH social, or click the link in our show notes. Back to the show. All right, we're back, and this week, for something old, something new, we are actually talking about this, the EDH rec effect. And... My advice for newer players, or for, let's just call it the most seasoned, and not the most seasoned of deck builders. EDH Rec is a great resource for building a deck from nothing. But pay attention to what you're making and why. Don't just follow it blindly. Because, A, you're going to end up finding way more than 100 cards that are going to show up as, you should put this in your deck. And a whole bunch of different things where these are the top cards. You should put these in your deck. Here's all of the things that everybody else puts in their decks. And that's fine. But if you're building this deck because you want to build it, then build the deck with the things that you want to build it for. Don't just follow things blindly. It's okay to come back, make edits, change things. Use it as a resource, but not as gospel. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And I think that's excellent advice. You know, as, as somebody who takes pride in constructing and sure. building decks from scratch, I think it can be easy for me to write off just how important EDH Rec uh, was and is to deck construction, especially for people who are just starting to make decks on their own. Right. Um, it's such a powerful tool. And without the knowledge that was given to me by uh, EDH rec and, uh, and the various stats that it contains, mm -hmm. it's, it's not likely that I would be in this spot where I feel comfortable making my own decks. The, the bones are there, the decks that they recommend, right. For the most part, they function, even though they are just amalgamated from other people's decks. It's kind of the, the genius of the mob, right? Right. And the other part of that is, this is why I'm specifically talking to people that, it, maybe 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 you're great at building decks, but you haven't done it a ton, or you're not sure if you're good or not, or you're just new. You and I are in the upper, upper, upper tier of people who love magic, because right. we love it to the point where we play it, we love it to the point where we talk about it, we love it to the point where we watch other people's content, and then we decided, you know what, it's not enough, I'm gonna make my own content, I need more! Which means that we know a lot of cards. We know a lot of synergies. Right. So, if you're not there, and you're just, you're dipping your toe in, or just 
man, I don't have the time to memorize all these cards or look at all these cards and know. It's okay. It's a great resource. It's a great way of building. Just don't think it's a copy and paste kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. What do you have for us this week, Alex? Well, Mike, basically I have the same advice, but it's applied a little bit differently. EDHREC has a feature that you don't really see too many people talk about, which is weird because it's right there on the uh, on the main menu, and that is the deck recommendations feature, edhrec.com slash rex, and you'll basically put in your deck list and your commander, and it will give you the same information as though you went to that uh, page's commander, but it is giving you that information contextualized to the decisions you made about your deck. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about that is that you can use this tool after you've built your deck and then see cards, maybe cards that you've already cut, maybe cards that you haven't heard of before, but it's only going to show you things that are relevant to you. Yeah. You're not just going to see an endless mix of cards that maybe you have some of them, maybe you don't, but you can't remember because you just built the deck. Which ones did I cut? This is very clear. We got two tabs, one for cards you don't have and the waiting for how heavily they recommend that you run them, and then the ones that you do have, and they wait how popular those are within the deck. And right here, I've, I've input my Emrakul the Promised End deck, which was a deck that we recently did a deck tech for, yep. and it's showing me some recommendations of cards that I don't have in the deck. The first one is Hedron Archive, which hmm. I've chosen not to have in the deck because I don't think that's a very good mana rock, but I have it in another deck because it's not that bad of a card. But if I were just copying and pasting, like Mike had said, I might have uh, might have had that card in my deck, and I'm sure at one point I did. And then we have uh, the three Urza lands, right? It's oh, yeah. To me. Urza's power plant, Urza's mine, and, and Urza's... Uh, tower. Tower, thank you. And I did try those initially, because I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assemble Urzatron and tap for seven mana. Huzzah! Uh, no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> Unless you're like a Golos deck or some kind of deck that can... Uh, tutor out multiple lands right no you're not ever it's it's a pipe dream mike um these are so popular in emrakul i'm for every hundred people that have recommended this i'd be surprised if one of them has ever as assembled or it's just not at, at least how fast they do it because i mean yeah. i get it for for something like you know again a, a colorless deck but when it gets into things where it's oh it's an artifact deck so you should worry about these there's there's other ways to ramp there's other ways to do it that don't require other cards to get you there except and right. now i'm getting in the weeds because i'm, I'm on ember cool mind um it's a great but, it's a great point it's a great right. i love the deck recommendations and the actual fact that i talk to a lot of people that use eda trek i talk to you and you are one of the very few people that I've ever heard actually reference this page, and it's awesome. Yeah, it's a great page. So yeah, maybe if you're a more veteran player, try putting your deck in here, see what comes up, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe it'll surprise you. Or even, you know what? I'm, I'm going to piggyback on that. Even if you're a newer player and you just want to see what else Mike. is out there, throw it up there. Copy paste. This is you copy pasting it to the website rather taking it from the website so that was that i that encourage what i you can't copy paste me i already copy pasted you ha -ha. <laughs> all right let's Love let's it. move to our uh to our card recommendations yeah section, let's uh let's go to ooh. can i see that and specifically talk about some cards that i'm looking on edh rec right now i'm gonna go ahead and start us off this week because I want to give a special shout out to Rachel Weeks at Rachel Reeks of the Commander Sphere podcast because she brought this one to my attention and then I, I pointed it out to you and you're like, oh, that's a pretty interesting fog. Let's talk about Tangle. Uh, this is one generic and a green for an instant. Prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn. Okay, so it's a little bit more expensive fog. Okay, if you care about, you know, combat decks, that's fine. But it has a second uh, area of text here. Attacking creatures don't untap during their controller's next untap steps. So, Alex. Yeah. This is fog. This is ridiculously political because you can save someone. Also, you want to talk about a crackback yeah. for somebody trying to kill you. This is a great card. Uh, it is uh, $2.50 and in 496 total decks on EDH Rec. 
What do you think, Alex? Have I, have, yeah, have, I have 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 Rachel and I done you proud? This is an excellent fog, Mike. But I it's think so that's good. that's really the heart of it is that it's a fog, mm-hmm. and in EDH, the fog has really fallen to the wayside. Yeah, um, as as combat has become, uh, in many people's eyes, less viable, even as uh, Wizards introduces new ways to do combat and to get shots in. I feel that uh, that fogs in general have just fallen off, and there are a couple of fogs that are just so good right. that you would never need to run more than that. For example, Constant Mists is the number one fog in the game, as far as I'm concerned, um, and that's because it has uh, a refund mechanic where you can right. just sack a land and get it right back to your hand. It's recurable. Which is, yeah, it's recurable. It, Constant Mist, you know, beats this lying on its back, but that's not the question. Because people know about constant mist, people don't know about this. And then after constant mist, you've uh, you got spore frog, mm-hmm. um, which is you play that in reanimator decks. So you can just sack it and reanimate it. The goodest, no combat damage. The goodest frog. You have the original fog, which is one mana, but yep. nobody runs that. Um, it's not really good enough to play. And then you have like the the tricky fogs that like white and blue have, where they'll like exchange control of creatures, or they'll make a. An enormous creature because you attack so hard. Right. But this is what green is doing. And green is doing something that is really more white and blue. Which yeah. Is why I bring that up. Each attacking creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. I just, so I you said crackback. This is <laughs> this is like a, a, a tactical strike that basically is a counter spell for an alpha strike. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a deflecting palm for the for the alpha. It's strike. a disarming strike. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it's as far as fogs go, it's fantastic. But I think that's why it's not popular. Fogs just don't see play. That's fair. That's fair. I I just I love I love the idea of not just preventing the combat damage to save somebody, but specifically the okay. You're going to try and attack me. Everybody sees that this guy is the threat, right? Okay, perfect. You're not going to untap any of your attacking creatures. We need to get rid of this guy. So I'm in I'm in metas that have uh, a lot of, you know, make as many tokens to attack as possible. Um, one of the players that I, I've, I've played with the most is a big fan of making the, of using the Xenagos Dragons uh, <laughs> deck. So I'm I'm a huge proponent of nope, nope. We need to prevent 25 damage from coming to my face right now. This is a good way for me to stop it. And hey, we now see what a big threat this person is. We need to eliminate them. But I get what you're saying. Fogs fogs are not as viable of a defense because combat is less and less of the most direct way for people to mm-hmm. win the game as as we get more and more cards. But it is one of those. I'm surprised I don't see this more often, especially in in decks that you know that combat matters. Like, I can't believe right. that this isn't in 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 a whole lot of Thantis decks. This fog does have something that most fogs don't, and that is that um, ability to extend itself into subsequent turns. It doesn't recur itself. It doesn't reanimate itself, but it does stretch one extra turn. Mm-hmm. By preventing the attack that subsequent turn, and also preventing blocking. So as far as as far as fogs go, this one's got pretty good value. I will give it that. That's all I need. Why don't you tell me about your card this week? Because I'm actually really excited to talk about this one. <laughs> sure, Mike. Um, so this card is Shared Discovery. Uh, it's single blue mana. Came out in Rise of the Eldrazi, and it's a sorcery for uh, for one mana. As an additional cost to cast this spell, tap four untapped creatures you control. So the cost of the spell is blue, tap four <laughs> creatures. And the effect of the spell is draw three cards. Mm-hmm. Now what immediately would come to mind is Ancestral Recall, yep. which is this spell, but it's an instant and you don't have to tap any creatures. That card's banned. Yeah. Now, the reason why I chose this one specifically, Mike, is because of how I feel about card draw in the colors that really know how to do it, blue and black, and now mostly green. (laughs) When I feel that I can get card draw out of a color, I don't want 
that like second rate cantrip nonsense where I'm barely eking out value. I want my cards to draw me cards. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever heard this aphorism, but one is none, Mike. Two is one. Huh. One is none, two is one, which means three is two. And okay. and that means that I'm netting two cards off of shared discovery. Combining for one mana. Combining the idea of card draw and card advantage into the same thing. Yes. Because if it just replaces itself, all you're really doing is your one is none. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. I like that. So if you are in a blue deck and you run creatures, and especially if you're in a blue deck with tokens, tapping four creatures is not that steep of a price. This card is fifteen cents. It's a common from yeah. Eyes of the Eldrazi. It's in three hundred and thirty decks. That's not enough. Blue token decks are not that rare. They just spoiled a new one. Yep. By the time this episode <laughs> goes live, people will probably know what I'm talking about. It's a deck with blue in it, and it makes tokens. And I bet you anything, this card would go great in there, but people aren't going to play it. Uh, how do you feel about this, Mike? I. This is one of those that it it does not apply under all types. Not not every deck would want shared discovery. Of course. But the decks that w could use shared discovery could really use shared discovery. So I'm I am very impressed with this pick because and nobody's I can't, playing it. I can't believe it's in 332 decks. Like nobody's playing it. How I, many blue token creature decks have you seen? I've seen a lot. Right. I, I mean the the top commanders for it all absolutely make sense. You look at Kai Kar, you look at Ta Talrand, you look at the Locust mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. I cannot believe that all three of those decks aren't running this this spell at like 50% of the time. Yeah. Because <laughs> the Locust God is literally replacing the things that you're you're tapping with. Talrand is making something when you cast the spell to tap it. Kaikar Kaikar gives you mana when you cast the spell and a creature. I just I like this is a really good card. And like you said, I Drawing a card on an effect, unless it's recurrable, I, I like mm. I like that phrase. I hadn't heard that before. One is none, two is one. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um. That's why a lot of my my cards that I actually play for card draw are either things like when it when a creature you control deals combat damage, draw a card, or an enchantment that recurs, or it's X spells where I'm trying to draw multiple. I want to make a big splash of the amount of cards that I'm going to draw so I get value off of it. Right. This is a one mana draw three cards with the quote unquote dunce, downside of tapping four untapped creatures. That's totally fine in a lot of the decks that I run. Yeah. I really a great pick by you. I like this one a lot, Alex. Thank you. So those are a couple of cards that, hey, if you haven't found them, uh, you should. And the numbers say that you haven't found them because they're not in nearly enough decks. Um, <laughs> if you have any cards that you want us to take a look at or just special, hey, why don't I see this card out in the wild? Go ahead and drop us a line and we will take a look at it ourselves. Moving on to our last segment here. Uh, typically, this is our judge's corner. But we're kind of twisting it a little bit because uh, we have an announcement for everybody. Alex, you've recently uh, acquired a new title. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and possibly why we're putting some shine on EDH Rec uh, at this point? Mike, I would be honored. Um, as of the first of this month, I am a product manager for EDHREC.com, and I could not be happier. Yay! I, I assure you that as as... Monotonous as I sound, I am overjoyed, and every day I have to pinch myself to to believe that it's not a dream. I really do work for EDH Rack. That is why we decided to go ahead and do this episode as a, kind of a lead-in and an homage to this website that means a lot to a lot of Commander players. Mm -hmm. And it means a lot to me that I'm able to to contribute to it now. Ad admittedly, it was going to be an episode we were going to do regardless, but it's an yeah. episode we're doing sooner than we planned because Alex Lapp! EDH rec employee. I saw the email. <laughs> it was official and everything. Yeah. So if you want to, uh, if you want to reach 
Alex Lap with EDH Rec. You can go ahead and get me at <laughs> Alex at EDH Rec dot com. And a boy. Or you can find me on Twitter. It's uh, Lapper Medic, L-A-P-P-E-R Medic. And uh, where can they find our podcast, Mike? Well, Alex, they're going to be able to find our podcast in a couple of different places. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can go at EDH underscore social. If you want to email us, we are at the social contract EDH at gmail.com. I'm really proud of you, buddy. I don't want to gloss over I'm, it. I I'm don't, thrilled. I, we've talked about it a couple of times uh, directly, but I especially want to. I want you to know how proud of you I am on the podcast for people to hear, for people to know. This has been a long time coming, Alex. You've you you've been when I first met you. When I went to a local game store, you were the one who I'm not a shy person, but I absolutely did not want to jump in anything and. That's the first time I can remember in a while that somebody reached out to me first and made sure I was comfortable and is mm-hmm. always somebody who wants people to have a good time playing Magic and is available for any questions that they have. So I'm extremely proud of you, and this is extremely deserved. So great job by you, and we're going to have more to come in the future. Mike, thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate you saying so. And uh, thank you to all of our listeners for listening in and coming to see us every week. Uh, you all have a good night. From Alex Lapp, EDH Rec employee, judge, Mike Almond, g- magic enthusiast guy, and person learning how to edit podcasts better and better <laughs> as we go. Um, we're going to have a lot of material coming for you in the near future. And I'm proud of you for what you've done. I'm proud of all of you for listening. Please subscribe, rate the podcast. Again, contact us with anything that you want to hear. If you've got some cards that you want us to look at. Thank you, everybody, for your time. We'll talk to you soon.